Hello everyone, I'm your host, Daniel James II, and you're listening to the Culture Connect, the podcast for the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, where we're celebrating 30 years of building bridges to resources and closing gaps within South Carolina's ethnic minority communities. Inspired by the vision of our great executive director, Dr. Dolores da Costa, we wanted to highlight the stories of ethnic minority voices across our great state of South Carolina. You're gonna hear from HBCU presidents, civil rights icons, farmers, minority entrepreneurs, men and women, striving every day to make South Carolina a great place to live for all of its citizens. Be sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss the notifications for the next episode of the Culture Connect on all digital platforms. Let's tune into the episode. You all, we have a very special guest in the studio today. I am sitting here with Chief Lamar Nelson. He is the chief as CEO and tribal archaeologist of the Eastern Cherokee, Southern Iroquois, and United Tribes of South Absolutely. Carolina. Absolutely, that's correct. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an <laughs> honor that, that you invited me here, and I hope that uh, we can provide information to everyone that mm-hmm. will help uh, publicize the, the true Native American people that's here in South Carolina. I love it. I love it, you know. So, listen, I want to start off talking about your roots a little bit. I know we talked a little bit before we began filming, but I just want to talk about your roots. I, I, I understand you have English and Irish ancestry, but you also come from a family um, of Native American ancestry as well, Cherokee and Choctaw tribes, I believe, as well. Talk a little bit about, because you have um, been very involved in your Native American culture and roots since a very early age. How did that awareness come about? in your life? Well, you know, that's interesting. Uh, I'm a mixed blood Native American. Mm -hmm. A lot of Native Americans are here in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, My dad, uh, all of his family had nine brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And so did my mother. And all my dad's brothers and sisters look like true what cowboys and Indians, so-called Native Americans would look like. They're all dark skin, long black hair, dark eyes, uh, my grandmother was half Cherokee. My mm-hmm. grandfather was half Choctaw. Okay. Uh, my great grandmother, uh, that was Cherokee, was a medicine woman. Mm. Now, on my mother's side, they're English and Irish, and I take I, I look a lot like my mother's side of the family. But I always practiced my Native American ancestry on my dad's side. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, uh, my grandmother would take me out in the forest, and she'd teach me about plants that I could make medicines out of that her mother had taught her. And so uh, at an early age, I was practicing my Native American heritage. And I remember as a child, uh, I had, I loved to read and I had got a set of encyclopedias and I was (laughs) reading encyclopedias and seeing about archeology span and Native Americans. And Mm -hmm. my dad had a big garden and I built me an archeological screen when I was 12 years old. Oh boy! And I went down in the garden, I started screening because I'd found some arrowheads and spear points down in there. And uh, so it really stirred my interest in Native American history. So my entire childhood as as a a young adult, uh, one of my brothers, I got two brothers and a sister, and one of my brothers was called Chief. He played (laughs) football and he had long hair and you know, people looked at us uh, because they knew our ancestors, yes, and they sir. would look at us as Native American people. Beautiful. So it was been a privilege to have had those ancestors on both sides. Amazing. And you were born in the upstate, right? I was born in the upstate okay. of South Carolina, Spartanburg County. Spartanburg County. And uh, my dad, uh, he was raised mostly in Greenville County in the Pelham area. Okay. And a lot of, uh, I remember when I was a kid that people would look at my dad's uh brothers and sisters and wondered mm-hmm. what they were. They were dark skinned, mm-hmm. had that long black hair, and mm-hmm. they didn't know if they were Italians or <laughs> or what they were. But mm-hmm. I know uh, my dad would always tell people that they were Native Americans. Amazing. Amazing. You mentioned, too, about your grandmother being a medicine woman. And my uh, great-grandmother. Your great-grandmother being yes. a medicine woman. And there was something about um, her using natural substances to... Um, heal 
or um, to administer some type of. Healing. She actually saved my grandmother's life yes. uh, during the flu, flu epidemic yes. uh, in the early 1900s. My grandmother was a young lady and she was mm-hmm. dying. Oh, wow. And my great grandmother, who was a medicine woman, mm-hmm. uh, she went out into the forest and she gathered up a bunch of material and she came back and she made a poultice. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people don't know what a poultice is, but she placed it on my grandmother's chest and she made this medicine out of roots and plants. Mm-hmm. And she had my grandmother to drink that medicine. And she did that for like two days. Mm-hmm. And immediately my grandmother started recovering. Wow. And my grandmother always told me when she, when I was a child, she said that if it hadn't been for her, her mother, she would have died. Oh, wow. But because she was a medicine woman, she knew all the natural plants and the natural healing. And she was able to use that to save her life. Do you feel like, there is a place even in this era of modern med- medicine because I, I recently came um, from China and they have similar, you know, frictions between modern medicine and what people call uh, uh, alternative medicine, which is for many, you know, Chinese people, it's actually traditional medicine versus modern medicine. Um, similar issues I feel like exist potentially within Native American and indigenous communities. Is there a space for, quote unquote, traditional medicinal practices, natural medicinal practices within the current era that we live in now? Absolutely, yeah. they are. Okay. Uh, I learned a lot of different things. I know you can take the inside bark of a wild cherry tree uh-huh. and you can boil that bark and you can gargle with it if you've got a sore throat and uh-huh. it will help cure the sore throat. Yeah. Uh, I remember talking about walnut holes, even with uh, fish. You can take walnut hulls and grind them up and put them into a small stream where there's little fish and it will make the fish go to sleep and they'll float to the top of the surface and you can gather the fish off the surface. Oh, wow. And there's so many different plants out there that you can use. I remember uh, sassafras tea. <laughs> My grandmother used to make me drink sassafras tea all the time and, mm-hmm. and it had a little bitter taste to it. So she oh, put wow. a little spoon of sugar in it. So there's a lot of different things that are still out there that Native Americans use today that will actually heal you rather than having to use a a type of pill that are prescribed by a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. There's just such a wealth of knowledge (laughs) (laughs) that you're pouring out today. I, you know, we know about your roots. We've covered your roots. We know a little bit about a little bit there. I guess we could spend days just talking about your roots and we know about, you know, your current renown as this great chief within South Carolina. But I want to talk about that middle there because a lot of times we don't know how people got to be where they are, who they are. You are by trade an archaeologist, like by trade. Uh, But, you know, a lot of young people, because we were talking about it earlier, you know, that are in South Carolina, there are a lot of young people actually studying archaeology. How did you as a young person, though, um, back when you were growing up, know this is what the field you wanted to go into? Did you sort of slide into it? And talk about some of those relationships that help I don't know, develop you from, you know, whether it's education, relationships that develop you to be, I don't know, tribal chief now. Well, I started uh, many, many years ago. Like I mentioned earlier, I love to read and Mm -hmm. I had read a lot about Native American history in South Carolina. And because my ancestors were Native American, Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to learn even more. Mm -hmm. So one of those things was I had started finding lots of airheads and spear points and really didn't know a lot about them. Mm -hmm. So I started studying about them. And then I started going to different events around the state, asking people, what is this really? What really is it? And a lot of things that people find called airheads are really atlatl points. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know about atlatls, but the atlatl was used for thousands of years before the bow and arrow. The bow really has only been in North America here in this area for about maybe 2,500 to 3,000 years even though it had been used in Europe and Asia, but it wasn't used here. So most of the artifacts that you're finding are really at lateral points. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was uh, gaining more and more interest. I was attending events. I started going to the ASCC events in Columbia. I started volunteering doing archaeology Mm -hmm. in a lot of different areas and gained more and more knowledge. And uh, so I've been doing archaeology for really 35 years. Mm -hmm. I've worked on a lot of different archaeological sites. And uh, it just led me more and more uh, into the Native American side and uh, working with the Native American people in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, working with our former chief, who was Chief Goins, who passed away several years ago. Yes, Dr. Um, Will Goins. Will, Will Goins, Will Chief Goins. Will Goins. He wow. was an honored person. Amazing. You know, and some people still may not know, you know, what um, an archaeologist or even tribal archaeology entails. But one of the things that we were talking about, you know, was you were working on some project that's 17,000 year old, has 17,000 year old artifacts in it. Tell us about some of the exciting, I don't know, discoveries that you've had in your journey of all these years being archaeology. Well, let's let's talk about, you know, there's historical archaeology and prehistoric archaeology. Okay. And I've done both. Uh, but I prefer the prehistoric side because of my ancestors. And uh, I've discovered some amazing artifacts in the 35 years that I've worked. Uh, some of the sites that I've worked on, this 17,000-year-old site, uh, when we first went there, the ground was covered with artifacts. There were thousands of artifacts there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we started doing excavations uh, many, many years ago there, and I'll be working there this year on two different occasions. Uh, it's a multi-component site. There's stuff from Mississippi and all the way through Paleo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're finding, we found Clovis points there uh, all the way back to the Mississippian phase where we're finding little triangular airheads and so forth. And it's so exciting to be able to find these, these type artifacts and to preserve them. Now, as tribal archaeologists, one thing I do is is I'm like a go-between between between the archaeological world and the Native American side. Yes. A lot of Native American people don't like archaeologists. And the reason they don't do that is because of what's happened in the past. A lot of archaeologists for hundreds of years, yes, hundreds of years even in South Carolina and in the United States, have dug up human remains. And there's over 300 sets of human remains still in museums and stored areas here in South Carolina. Yeah. And we've been working on that for many, many years, try to get those human remains removed. But uh, some of the Native people, they still see archaeologists as digging up their ancestors. And I had a, a Cherokee chief tell me many, many years ago, he said, how would you like it if I dug up your grandma? Yeah. And But what I'm trying to do as tribal archaeologists is be a go-between to show Native American people that I am trying to preserve their history and protect their ancestors. Uh, a lot of this stuff's going to get looted. There's lots of looters across South Carolina, and they will dig up this stuff and sell it at a flea market. But I'm hoping by excavating some of these artifacts that we can preserve them and put them in this museum that I'm trying to get built. And we can talk more about that too, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to get this museum built, and we'll put the artifacts there. And all the native people in South Carolina go there and see what their ancestors made. It's amazing the things that were created by Native American people in South Carolina. That's right. They were artists. They were unbelievable people. And I want this stuff to be shown rather than sold at a flea market. That's right. That's right. As it should be. And it's so unfortunate that a lot of times when people came coming in to these communities claiming to preserve culture or even they may be by trade also an archaeologist there is sort of a trauma that native american people have when it comes to contacting people that you know want to get a hold of these artifacts there have even been you know exploitation of these artifacts and that exists in a lot of um ethnic minority communities but it's it's a distinct legacy um that uh, Native American people have had to grapple with and fight against. And so it's powerful to see somebody who is both Native American and a tribal archaeologist, because like you said, you can be that go between. Uh, I think in my mind, I still cannot fathom being having so much knowledge about Native American history, but also having so much knowledge about archaeology and how to examine artifact when you come in contact with it. What's your thought process when you see an artifact that maybe you've never come into contact with before like how do you what's your one two three like what's your steps well you go through? it gives me cold chills sitting here thinking about okay. it it really does <laughs> uh i love my history and my ancestors mm -hmm. i really do it's a passion of mine archaeology yes. and native american history is a huge passion of mine mm -hmm. and i've spent a lot of my life working to preserve it and to promote it mm -hmm. uh I, I, want, I want to tell you this story. I, I believe that uh, there were spirits 
that that uh, a lot of people don't believe in Native American spirits, but I do. And I'm going to give you an example. I was looking for artifacts one time near a lake and my wife was walking with me. All of a sudden, a huge red tail hawk landed in a tree above my head. And I looked at the hawk and it started speaking to me. It was making a, a sound like a, a hawk sound. Mm-hmm. And so I looked up and I said, uh, I know you're trying to tell me something. What are you trying to tell me? And so uh, my wife, I said, this hawk is telling me something. I looked up at it two or three times and it just kept squawking at me and squawking at me. And finally, I looked down at my shoe and about two inches from the end of my shoe was a huge Native American spear point, a very large one. Wow. And I always said that that, that was a, a spirit hawk. Mm-hmm. And it was trying to tell me, I want you to stop and pick that up because it knew that I would honor that artifact. Oh, wow. You know, it meant so much to me. And when, when I pick up an artifact, when it, whether it's a surface find or whether it's in an excavation, I think about the people thousands of years ago that created it. Mm-hmm. And when I pick it up and I hold it in my hand, and I know that 2,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, some individual was making that artifact, and I'm the first person to hold it in my hand in thousands of years. What a special feeling that is to me to be able to do that. It's oh. such an honor. Yes, I believe it is. I can imagine. And those encounters, I'm sure, are recurring. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Canoe Project as well, because that's another example of something that is um, there has been strive debate but also for native american people it's a it's treasured history as well uh i want to ask you though because you are the chief of the eastern cherokee southern iroquois united tribes of south carolina uh i understand talk a little bit about the the history of that tribal formation and i know it has its roots deeply well deeply woven into its history is also some history about the early church in South Carolina as well. There's some church history along with Native American contact. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there have been Native Americans uh, in South Carolina a lot longer than we originally thought. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back and read the school books that I had, you know, they said that they were only Native American people like 10,000 years uh, Mm -hmm. in the South or in in what is now the United States. Mm -hmm. But through archaeology, we have now discovered that there's been people here many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. The Topper site in South Carolina has uncovered artifacts that they believe is 25,000 years old. And and they're they're probably going to prove that. Mm -hmm. And the Cherokee people actually moved down here from up north. Uh, about 3,000 years ago, they moved from up north, what is into Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and northern Georgia. Yeah. All these areas that we had these tribal people here. Mm-hmm. And there were thousands and thousands of Cherokee, Cherokee people here. Mm-hmm. And there were many other tribes that were in South Carolina. You know, the PD, the Santee, the Waccamaw, the Wasamaw. <laughs> you know, all of these people were here. Yes. The Catawba and many, many tribes were here. Mm-hmm. And they were decimated, you know, when Europeans came here, uh, yeah. did away with most of those people. It's it's a horrible story, and I've told it many, many times of what happened to the native people when Europeans arrived here and took over their country. Thank you so much. And I think, um, you know, for someone who may not uh, know the the deep history and also that time period, you know, we can't even fathom uh, a couple hundred years because this country is only what, not even 300 years old yet and to think that native peoples were here you know 25,000 it I mean there's a lot of history that is buried and so uh, thank you for being the one to sort of unearth it and uncover it and I'm looking forward to it I'm looking forward to it now there is this you know story about and and after this we're going to get to talk about you being chief and some of the legacy of Dr. Will Goins, but I want to, since we're here, talk about this canoe project. Apparently, in 1997, there's this man from Mount Pleasant who, you know, discovers this canoe, and um, apparently he tried to exploit it for profit. But of course, it was it rightfully belonged to the Native American people. It was a Native American artifact, and it's it's a canoe that has been determined to be like. Over four thousand years old or something. That's like correct. That? Tell us about that. You know, project. well, it it's a 
It's a positive story and a sad story, too. Mm -hmm. Originally, when this canoe was found, Mm -hmm. and the guy that found it, he pulled it out of the the Mm riverbank. He actually said that there was part of it still left there. Wow. And so he tried to sell it. Mm -hmm. And when the DNR found out about it, they went to him and said, you know, you can't sell this. You got to give it to us. And the guy refused to do that. And so they tried to get him to tell them where the rest of the canoe was. And he made a comment, you know, a real bad comment about, I won't give you the rest of the canoe and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they actually took it away from him. Well, this guy didn't like it at all. And so we have, we have no provenience, you know, we have no exact location of where it came from. We got a a good idea, but not an exact location. Now it's stored at the Warren Latch down at uh, Charleston. Mm -hmm. And I've been there. Uh, they're preserving that canoe and hopefully it's going to be displayed uh, Mm -hmm. somewhere probably in the lower part of the state because it come off, you know, the river down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, This canoe is really late archaic. Mm -hmm. uh, Some people originally said, well, it belongs to my tribe or it belongs to this tribe or that tribe. It can't. That's impossible. You know, uh, this was an archaic canoe and archaic people were hunter gatherers. They were still traveling around in you know in different areas. They they wouldn't build in village sites. Uh, they didn't have palisade walls and so uh-huh. forth. And uh, so no one tribe in South Carolina can claim that. It belongs to all of us. It belongs to uh, whoever's a Native American could be related to the people that built that canoe. No matter what tribe you're from, yeah. you could be related to those people. Uh, it's an important artifact. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a shame that we couldn't have found where the rest of it is and got it so that we could preserve it too. Mm-hmm. But at least we have that part and it's part of our history and it shows that archaic people thousands of years ago was building canoes also. That's amazing. See, thank you for saying that last part because I did read where you said in an interview or talking to the press about how, you know, who the artifact belongs to is not the important part, at least as it relates to the canoe project. It was the fact that Native American people did use canoes. They used them to hunt and to gather and to travel. And like, that's the important part of the history. You still maintain that? Absolutely. You know, it belongs to all of us, not one particular person, one particular tribe. It belongs to everybody. All Native American people is the owners of that. Yes, sir. And I think that that's important for future generations to know that as well. I think it creates, it definitely creates unity. And I think that that's, um, it's befitting for the chief of the Eastern Cherokee, Southern Iroquois, Southern, Eastern Cherokee, Southern Iroquois, and United Tribes of South Carolina to say that as well. I want to ask you about the importance, because we've mentioned it being important to preserve culture preserve history preserve these native american artifacts but you know we're moving to like this age of technology and um where you know if it's not accessible at hand i don't really care uh and you know to be an archaeologist or even to care about these artifacts it's going to take some some empathy that technology doesn't allow us always the space to have or create why should future generations like Gen Z, I'm Gen Z, born 2000, why should they care? And especially Gen Zers who are Native American, why should they care about preserving this, these artifacts or Native American history? And what impact does it have on the future of um, generations of Native American folks? Well, one thing that I want to I want to emphasize, no matter what race of people you are, mm-hmm. You should be proud of your ancestors Mm -hmm. and you should be proud of what they created, Mm -hmm. no matter who you are. Uh, I'm proud of my ancestors, uh, the Native American society, especially. Uh, They created huge societies in North America Mm -hmm. at huge village sites and beautiful, beautiful sculptures and pottery and, and artifacts that they created. And young people today, they get too tied up with their phones and their computers and not going outdoors. Mm -hmm. And they need to be learning about their ancestors. Talk to your your grandparents, your aunts and uncles that are older people. Talk to them and find out what they did when they were children. What did you do to play outdoors? There's more to life than computers and phones. 
right. walking in the wilderness, uh, listening to the birds yeah. and the trees. Yeah. And uh, seeing the butterflies, that mm. is so important, you know, for people. And and I and I teach that to children, you know, get outdoors and do some of these things. You know, don't sit in the house all the time. Uh, these artifacts that were created, uh, they'll be in museums. And I want you to see those and know what they are. Know that your ancestors, if you're a Native American, I want you to, to know how did they create a bow? What was an atlatl? Uh, what is the difference between an airhead and a spear point and an atlatl point? What is the difference in those? And to be able to learn that, you've got to go to museums. You've got to ask questions. You've got to read. I've got over 2,000 books, and I love to read. And you've got to do that to get smarter. Ask questions and read. It's so true, Chief um, Nelson. I think that even when I look at my own life and you know my family history, I didn't have an opportunity to interview or sit down and talk with my great grandparents but my grandparents one of the reasons I know about my family's history you know we are African Americans and a lot of us have descendant of slavery DOS heritage um, you know rooting back to plantations that are in Bennettsville South Carolina and Florence County South Carolina and the reason I know about some of that history and even just their parents and their family and where they were located in some of their history is by asking questions, asking hard questions, sit my grandparents down when we're just in free time and saying, you know, tell me about your mom, tell me about your dad, tell me about. And so when they passed, I was able to write the reason I knew a lot of the, and was able to write the written history and obituaries was because I knew the oral history. And that is also very important. Uh, and then backing that up with like, also reading about some of the places too so all of that does work in concert together it know? works with with every race of people every mm -hmm. religion of people yes sir. you know uh it, and it's very important mm -hmm. one thing that i started doing in august 27th 1987 mm -hmm. i started writing a journal Beautiful. and i have written one page of my life every day since 1987 now, there, I, I say that, but there's been a couple of times I, I was uh, had an operation and my wife recorded the journal for me while yeah. I was in the hospital. But I've been, I, I love to camp and I've been in a tent while my wife holding a flashlight and writing a journal. I've been in a hotel room. And today uh, I'm in Columbia at, at this wonderful office here with you great people and the Commission of Minority Affairs. And I'm going to write when I get home tonight, when I sit down at the kitchen table, I'll write that I was interviewed by by this young man here, and I'll I'll record uh, about the interview and so mm -hmm. forth, and what we talked about in I my journal. I, I write that one page, and I'm on book sixty six. I have two hundred pages <laughs> per book. You can add that up, and you can see how many pages. It's over thirteen thousand pages God. that I've written. And I do it because when I was a child, I used to love to sit and listen to old people talk. Yeah. And and I would sit with my grandmother mm -hmm. and my grandfather who uh -huh. was native, and I'd ask them a million questions. Yes, and and I can remember my dad saying, Lamar, please quit quit talking so much. <laughs> you're you're talking and my grandmother would say, My dad's name was David, and she'd say, David, you leave that boy alone oh, now. You goodness. just leave him alone. And so I learned a lot about my Native American ancestry by asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I record that journal so that my children yeah. will be able to have that information when I'm gone. They'll be able to go back and see what my life was. And uh, I record a lot of different things. Wow. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you who the chief historian I used to interview was at my um my grandfather's name is also David. Oh, really? <laughs> David All right. Franklin Cross. I would have loved to meet him. Oh, yes. And he was the one that I always um, would sit and ask questions. Now, when he puts on his glasses, that's how I knew he was getting serious about <laughs> answering what I had to ask. And then my grandmother, Sarah, as well. Uh, and then I know you have a son named Daniel. My name's Daniel. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of connections here. Uh, yeah, even in the we got stories. a lot of connections. That's right. That's yep. right. I I do want to ask you though about your children and talk about mentoring or what you tell young people. You know, have you created a, a program or a mechanism by which you can pour into, or is it sort of just informal young people that you come in contact with? And uh, maybe are your children as um, invested in their name. They are, history. you know, not as much as I am. Uh, my son is a fireman EMT. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Workloud. 
Okay. And my daughter, uh, she's a CRNA, awesome. and uh, which is a nurse anesthetist. People put you to sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and her her Native American name is Morning Hawk. And the reason I named her Morning Hawk was every time she's out in the yard and she loves to hike, every time she's outside, there's always hawks, hawks circling above her. And I said, it's her spirit hawks. <laughs> and I named her Morning Hawk. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've kept them involved in my Native American ancestry their mm-hmm. whole lives. Uh, they used to go help me find airheads and spear points. And uh, so they got really, really good at it. I, I remember it sort of funny. I, I used to tell them that I'd give them a, a dollar for every one they found. Mm-hmm. And after about two months, they got so good at it, they were breaking me. So I had to reduce it to a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so I've kept them involved and okay. I get other children involved too. I love working with children. I do a lot of Native American programs at schools and so forth. Uh, and it, But it's so sad uh, then in South Carolina, I've had so many people come to me, young people, mm-hmm. and say, are they real Indians in South Carolina? And really, you know, we're not Indians. We're Native Americans. People from India are Indians. Mm-hmm. But it is sad that uh, in today's society that there's so few people that knows the history of the Native people that's here in this state. Yes, sir. And that's the reason I do schools and public outreach so that we can promote Native American history. And, you know, with these recent waves of trying to etch out, you know, so many the histories of different peoples from textbooks and knowledge, it is important that we have people here to preserve that knowledge like yourself. But it does have to be passed on in order for the work to have impact beyond beyond, you know, people like um, Dr. Goins or yourself, Chief Nelson. So, uh, but I believe you're doing the great, you're doing the great work of, of getting that done. And so I'm excited about it. Now you become the chief of um, of the Eastern Cherokee, Southern Iroquois, United Tribe of South Carolina uh, after Dr. Goins dies, right? That's correct. Talk a little bit about his legacy. And he, he was such an important person, uh, a Native American here in South Carolina. He started the Native American Film Festival. Okay. Uh, he went all over the state and, and out of the state, and he uh, was promoting Native American history and the Native per- people here in the state and across the nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he was a big uh, uh, person that did that, mm-hmm. and it was it was such a tragedy when he passed away. I was close to him. Uh, I had did some uh, different events with him and uh, asked him a million questions. Mm-hmm. And he died unexpectedly of a massive heart attack. Yes. And uh, I want to throw this out too. When he passed away, if there's a person out there, uh, someone broke into his car when he passed away, and they stole all our tribal computers and all our tribal cameras and a lot of his Native American regalia. And that was stolen out of his vehicle when he passed away. And and I would definitely love to have that stuff back. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, it was just sad that that happened. But after he passed away, we had a mourning period Mm -hmm. uh, to honor him. And then uh, the past board Mm -hmm. uh, knew of my interest in my work that I had done for Native people. And so uh, they elected me because I was a tribal member. They elected me as their new chief. And I'm the, uh, the tribal chief, CEO and tribal archaeologist. And it was an honor. Yeah. It was such an honor to be elected as chief. And I have poured a lot of my life into it, and I will continue to do it. You know, I'll be 71 years old in September, and I hope to live to be 100, and I'm going to promote Native American history in our mm-hmm. tribe as long as I can. And, you know, we've started powwows. We've had two powwows over at Hey Good Meal in Pickens, South Carolina. And next May the 4th, I hope everybody will come and visit us. We'll be over there at Hey Good Meal again. And uh, we'll be doing dancing and singing and drumming and vendors and talking about Native Americans. And uh, we'll have all kinds of things going over there for you to come see. So it's it's such an honor to be chief here of, mm-hmm. of our tribe. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hope to continue to honor his legacy here in South Carolina of Chief Coins. He was an yes, amazing sir. man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The way you talk about him is very endearing. So I believe that. Uh, 
now your relationship with other chiefs across the state has also been good yeah work together okay yeah one thing and i'm glad you asked that question because here in south carolina in the past we've had some animosity between different tribes and different chiefs Mm -hmm. i want that to go away and it should and we've made huge progress in the last few years uh I sit on the Council of Chiefs mm-hmm. here in South Carolina, and we meet regularly. And uh, one thing that I said when I became chief and the very first meeting that I went to, I, I wanted them to know that I support every tribe here in South Carolina, and I will do anything in my power to help any tribe in this state or any of the Native American people mm-hmm. or the chiefs. I want us all to work together. And yes. we've made huge progress. Mm-hmm. And we are working together and we are helping each other and we distribute food, you know, in the fall mm-hmm. uh, around Christmas time. We distribute food and we do all kinds of things to help each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that is so enlightening now that we're doing that. Yes. But I've got a great relationship with all the other tribal chiefs and vice chiefs and native people in the state. And uh, we're going to we're going to make some major changes in yes. the lives of native native american people i hope i'm excited i'm excited about it and i pray you live to be 100 so you can see it and keep being strong in that work as well now what you have described is really the type of work that cma seeks to do which is close gaps within ethnic minority communities that's part of you know our vision for this 30th year we're celebrating 30 years quickly before we get on to this new endeavor i want to you know, ask you just for the audience that don't know your relationship to the commission and what the what resources the commission has or has been for Native American tribes and your organization. Talk a little bit about the impact CMA has had and your relationship to the commission. Commission of Minority Affairs is a wonderful state organization. Mm-hmm. It is unbelievable what they can do to help you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. DaCosta is an amazing lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think the world of her, and she has been so helpful to me, and the people here at, at mm-hmm. CMA has been so helpful to me and my tribe mm-hmm. uh, with uh, all types of things. No matter what it is, I can call Dr. DaCosta, I could call any of the people here, mm-hmm. and I've always had uh, a, an amazing response. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't question. Uh, they say, what can I do to help you? Mm-hmm. And they move forward with it. Yes, sir. And, and I think that's so wonderful. And I want the uh, people here of South Carolina to know mm-hmm. that, you know, the Commission of Minority Affairs is here for you. Yeah. Whether you're a Latino, whether you're African-American or whatever religion or organization or race you are, this, this organization, CMA, is here for you. Yes, and the Native American people, uh, seek them out. Yes, sir. They will help you no matter what tribe you are here in South Carolina. If you call CMA, they're on your side. Yes. And that is the work of the commission, just what you talked about. And sometimes people just don't know that this is a, a resource for them. And so hopefully this reaches the right audience and the right crowd. Now, just to talk about some of those events again and the things that you host. Now, you mentioned the powwow talk about the film festival does the film festival still go on and then you know the powwows are is everyone invited to come the powwow is it's it's a gathering a powwow is a gathering uh native american people did it to celebrate Mm -hmm. uh to trade to promote and today in the modern world we have powwows we do drumming singing dancing Everyone is invited. You don't have to be just a Native American. Anyone can come to the powwow. We have a wonderful time. Uh, we do friendship dances. You can come out and dance with us. You can, uh, if you're Native American, you want to wear regalia. You can dress up in regalia. I do, and a lot of the other people do. And a lot of the chiefs are now supporting each other and going to the different powwows. Uh, our first powwow that we had over in Pickens, South Carolina at Hey Good Meal, we had 700 people there. Uh, last year, even though it had been raining, we still had over 400 people showed up at our powwow. So our next powwow will be May the 4th, uh, 2024 at Haygood Mill in Pickens, South Carolina. We'd love to have you come there and uh, bring your children. 
Uh, we want children to come. We want them to be able to see things that's going on. We'll have potters there, people doing uh, flint napping, making airheads and spear points. Uh, you'll be able to go out and dance. We do a candy dance. Oh, wow. We uh, we gave children, the, the mothers probably didn't like it, but we gave them 20 pounds of candy. We sprinkle it on the floor and the children dance. And when the song stops, they re- reach and grab candy and they pick it up, put it in their bag. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're having a lot of fun. So we want you to come and join us. Thank you. It's May 4th. May the 4th, 2024. 2024. Wow. Well, it'll be here before we know it. So yeah, it will. We are already about. starting our planning right now. <laughs> That's good. I'm excited about it. Now, you have a, a an even bigger project, and I'm going to give you just a space to really talk about it because this is your, you're sort of um, on a campaign trail, not electoral or political, but this is a cultural campaign for uh, a museum. Yes. What to bring to South Carolina. Talk about what the museum is, what it will serve to do. And yes. Well, there's two projects that I'm working on, two major projects. Mm-hmm. That one of them I didn't mention to you, but I want to I want to highlight it first and then we'll okay. get to the museum. Mm-hmm. In South Carolina, as far as I know, my tribe is the only tribe in South Carolina that does not have our own tribal lands. Wow. Now, we got we got to realize that all the lands that's here in this state once belonged to the Native American people. And when Europeans came here, they took all of it away. So uh, all these buildings and in the upstate uh, where a lot of the Cherokee people were, all those lands up there belong to my ancestors. And I'm trying my best to get us tribal lands. I'm hoping that someone in the upstate uh, will donate some land to our tribe so that we can put our tribal office there and our powwow grounds so that I don't have to go out and rent land. Yes. Uh, We'll put that there. And... uh, Somebody out there in, in this world, uh, reach out to me and uh, donate land, and we'll preserve it forever. We're going to protect the land, the trees, the bugs, the flowers. We're going to protect, protect it forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, my second major project is I am trying to get a Native American Research Museum built in South Carolina. I've got a lot of support. Uh, the Commission of Minority Affairs, the Native American Studies Center, the Museum in Columbia, Council of Chiefs. Uh, Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology, all these people are supporting this. What I'm trying to do is there's thousands of artifacts sitting in people's closets that Grandpa found on a farm, and he put them in a shoebox, and they're sitting in a closet somewhere. Nobody to be able to look at them. Well, if I can get a Native American Research Museum built, and I'd like to build it in the upstate because of the other large museums in, in Columbia and down in the lower part of the state, We'll build this museum and we'll be able to take all the artifacts that people have and we'll take them to the museum. Most of them don't have any provenience for them. Uh, they just been, uh, they wasn't done archaeologically. They were just found on a farmer's field. And we'll be able to put those artifacts there. And young archaeologists that don't have a lot of field experience, they just got classroom experience, they'll be able to go there and pull these artifacts out, uh, be able to study them. Uh, Native Americans can go there, individuals alike, and we'll have artifacts displayed, but we'll also have this research facility. And, you know, we can put, uh, I've got a large collection and a lot of other people do too. And I've had many, many people come to me and said, if you'll get this museum built, I'll give you my collections. And some of them have thousands of airheads and spear points in them. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a huge benefit for the state of South Carolina, mm-hmm. and for the Native American people, to have a Native American research museum built. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking for a multi-million dollar museum, not just a small uh, little museum like some of these counties have. I want a multi-million dollar museum, a lot the wonderful African American museum we got built in the lower part of the state that people need to go see. Yes, it's a beautiful museum, the Columbia Museum, Charleston Museum. So let's build one in the upstate Mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to the Native American, to the thousands and thousands of Native American people that's in this state deserve a museum. So let's build this big museum for them. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, everybody's got my contact information. Call me, email me, and work with me. Uh, Let's get this museum built. Yes, sir. And we're going to put that contact info so you can stay in touch and if you want to are you able to donate people are able to donate people to the can cause? donate you okay. know donate money okay uh 
we're going to need a lot of me- money to build this yes. museum. Yes, we sir. really are. And but can you imagine uh, the emphasis that we can put on Native American people? And let individuals like know that, you know, some of their ancestors might have been native. Yeah. Uh, if you'll just do some research, you might find out you got Native American ancestry and you can be part of this museum if you can help us out. Yes, sir. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the prospect and I can't wait until it's up and running so I can come. What's the difference between uh, a, a research museum, like this focus on research? I imagine it could gravitate a lot of students. Um, but also potentially tribal archaeologists. Like, what's the difference between a research museum and a just a museum? Well, uh, just a museum. If you go to the Columbia Museum, you know they got all these different uh, periods of time, mm-hmm. no matter what period of time it was, and they've got artifacts displayed there. A lot of them's reproductions and so forth. And they will, you will be able to go through there and see a lot of different time periods in history. A Native American research museum. We're going to have artifacts displayed, real artifacts displayed. We'll probably have some reproductions displayed, uh, some Catawba pottery. You know, I've got a, a Catawba pottery collection that's going to be there. and But we'll have thousands and thousands of artifacts that, as I mentioned earlier, that have no provenience with them. And so there's no, most people don't know where they were found. They don't know what date they were found on. They're just artifacts. And, uh, you know, the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology don't want them. Most museums today are completely full. They have nowhere to go with them. Yes. This new museum, we'll be able to take all these collections that people's got. And you'll be able to open the drawers. You don't have to worry about uh, losing the location of it. You'll be able to lay them out on a table, study them. These young archaeologists are going to be able to go there and pull out hundreds of different artifacts from different time periods. Mm-hmm. And they'll learn... Uh, because they don't have the field experience, you'll learn what a triangular point is, uh, what a Mississippian triangular or a Clovis point or a Dalton point or a, a Taylor or a Palmer. You know, there's so many different names of these artifacts, and a lot of people don't know what th- they don't have that information. But by this research, you'll be able to do research, and you're going to learn this. And that way, when you go to the field and you pick up these things or you excavate them, you'll know what they are. Mm-hmm. I love it. Uh, you're making me realize how much I do not know. So I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. May I just say this really quickly? And I always I always tell my friends not to group in Southerners, how we talk, and our accent in particular. Carolina people have a distinct accent. And let me tell you something. I appreciate you and your accent today. <laughs> you are a true Carolinian. And I can hear it in your voice and the way that you talk and the way you talk with grace, humility, but you have like the Carolina twang. And I just love that so well, much. Well, I appreciate that oh, very much. Goodness. You know, I grew up here in yes. South Carolina my whole life. And and I remember uh, my wife and I went to uh, <laughs> a trip to Washington State yes. several years ago. Uh-huh. And we were on a boat up there, and these people came to me, and they said, where are you from? (laughs) You ain't from around here, I know. And I started laughing, and my wife was laughing. I said, well, I'm from South Carolina. They said, well, we knew you was from somewhere down there. (laughs) Somewhere, somewhere. And I get get that, too. And um, sometimes where I'm going, different places. And so I always tell them, you know, know this. Realize this Carolina accent is sweet. It is. (laughs) It is very sweet. So. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate even more importantly, the work that you're doing for Native American people, the Eastern Cherokee and Southern Iroquois United Tribe, South Carolina, and Native American folks, and just people in general, um, making us more knowledgeable about Native American people and even encouraging them to be more knowledgeable about themselves and their people. I really do appreciate that. Well, and I just want to say, you know, I love I love my Native American ancestors. Uh, mm-hmm. I think about my grandmother, uh, Nelson, all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was such an honored person to me, and she taught me so much. And so did my mm-hmm. grandfather, who was half Choctaw, and my grandmother half Cherokee. Mm-hmm. And and I, I love my mother's side of the family, too, but but I spent so much time with my native side and I learned from them. And, and 
even today, I, I think about them all the time. And I wish I, I did ask them a million questions. Mm -hmm. and, and I know probably sometimes they got tired of me talking to them. Mm -hmm. But I, even today, as, as I know you've heard other people say, I wish I could still sit and talk Good to them. God. And I encourage you, I encourage you, if you're a young person, please go out and talk to your grandparents and great grandparents and learn as much as you can and write it down. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you get 70, 80 years old, you might forget what they said. But if you write it down, record it like I write a journal and uh, I record that information and uh, I'll be recording uh, Daniel James's name today <laughs> in my journal that I was able to talk to him. And this young lady over here that's an expert at filming, you know, I'll yes. be able to record all this. And, and I, I do appreciate, you know, all the time that CMA is giving me and the help that this, you know, I, I promote CMA everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. I really do because I think you guys are a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. I really do. You help everybody. No matter who you are, you help them. And, and I'm, my Native American side, you've helped me a lot. Yes. And, you know, and I, I hope that you'll continue to help me in the future. And uh, Dr. DaCosta mm -hmm. is an amazing lady. Yes, she is. Uh, I consider her a friend. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you for your time. I appreciate this. Of, of course. And uh, we are grateful for our executive director, her vision and the staff. Me and Marcy, you're honored to be in your notebook today. Uh, I just want to end by, you know, asking you if you have any closing thoughts to wrap us up, you know, and of course, please give us, you know, how we can stay in contact with it. You may not have it on hand, but we can also put it on the screen. And then do you have any like speaking events coming up that we can attend or be at? Well, I do a lot of public outreach events. I'll be at Walnut Grove Plantation. Uh, I'll be at Hey Good Meal over in Pickens, South Carolina. I'll be in Belton, South Carolina, uh, where I do uh, mm -hmm. public outreach and identify Native American artifacts for people. And I talk to children and educate them about true Native American history because today South, in South Carolina, there's very, very little information in the school books about Native people. And so that's what we're doing is as tribal chiefs. We're going around and educating children, especially. Mm -hmm. We go to libraries and public outreach to, mm -hmm. to teach children about Native American people. And, you know, you can contact me. If anybody wants to get in contact with me, we got a Facebook page. I do better by emails and phone calls. Uh, you can call me, uh, uh, area code 864-978-9525, or you can email me at lnelson952 at yahoo.com. Uh, we've got a web page. Uh, I live in the upstate of South Carolina, up in Spartanburg County. So if anybody wants to call me or talk to me, uh, if you think you got Native American ancestry and you want to be a member of my tribe, you can if you can prove through documentation. But you got to have the documentation and you got to fill out an application. Uh, we'd love to have you as a tribal member, but just make sure you got that information, you know, before you call me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an honor. It's an honor to be chief, Yes, sir. you know, uh, and it's a lifelong position for me. Yes, sir. And I want to do everything I can to help my tribal people to get us tribal lands, to get this tribal, this uh, Native American Research Museum built. And, you know, I care for people. I don't care who you are. I care for you. And I'll help you in any way that I possibly can. And, mm -hmm. and I care for all the other tribal chiefs. You know, they're, these are honored people. These tribal chiefs are honored people and the vice chiefs. And we want to help them every way that we possibly can. Yes, sir. How old are you, Chief Nelson? I'll be 71 in September. September the 10th, I'll be 71 years old. Tell you. And I've dedicated uh, my entire life to my Native American ancestry. Uh, I really remember as just a kid. And like I said, I built an archaeological screen when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Started screening for artifacts in my dad's garden. I love it. I remember that very, very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so hopefully I'll be able to continue this for many, many more years yes, as sir. tribal chief. And then we'll we'll pass it on to someone else. Yes, but, sir. you know, it's it's just a legacy that I want to continue. A chief Goins' legacy, I want to continue to promote his life and Hopefully, I'll be able to do some of the things that he did and work with these other tribal chiefs, too, to make life better for Native American people in South Carolina. I love it. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chief Nelson. It's been a pleasure. To have it's you. been an honor for me to be here. Yes, sir. All right. We'll see you all next time. Okay. Bye-bye.
Did you enjoy the episode? I hope you did. Be sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on all digital platforms so you don't miss the next episode of the Culture Connect. We'll see you next time, everybody.